Good afternoon, IPDET 2015. We have such an exciting afternoon for you. Uh, our uh, five mini workshop sessions that we have, I think, are going to be such a treat for you. But before we have that treat, we have another treat for you in the uh, speakers that we have for you and um, the response to the speaker that we have. We have Ted Freeman speaking this afternoon, followed by John May. And Ted Freeman uh, will be speaking on contribution analysis, something that many of you know about, you like the concept, but you are a little bit unsure of the application of it to your work. So I know this is going to be something in which you are very interested. Uh, Ted Freeman worked for many years in government and uh, then worked for some time with Goss Gilroy, a uh, Ottawa-based evaluation firm. And he established their international development evaluation practice. Many years experience and uh, he remains a senior associate there. He specialized in the role of team leader on large, complex evaluations, multiple clients. And this has allowed him to engage with changing methods and theories of evaluation, but always from the perspective of practical and cost-effective implementation of sound methodologies. His most recent project uh, has been a large evaluation, an evaluation of Denmark's uh, global strategy for support to sexual and reproduction health and rights. And this has featured contribution analysis as its uh, central analytic framework. So I think this is going to be very interesting for all of us. Uh, at the end of his talk, I will introduce John Main, and John will uh, come up. John, as you know, is the father of contribution analysis, so it's going to be very interesting to get his response to Ted's um, use and application of contribution analysis. So I'll introduce John after uh, Ted's comments, and then we will have uh, time, I hope, to open the floor for some Q&A. So uh, please join me in warmly welcoming Ted. Ted, welcome. Good to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, is the microphone okay? Good. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you haven't encountered contribution analysis yet, I'm sure you will because many evaluation departments are, are more and more asking for it in their terms of reference and uh, many more evaluations are starting to use contribution analysis as a methodology. Uh, as Linda said, I'm going to deal... Pardon? One, two? Is that good? Okay. So as, as Linda said, I'm going to concentrate on the uh, experience in 2014 of evaluating Denmark's uh, strategy for supporting sexual and reproductive health and rights globally. Um, the uh, evaluation team, just to quickly give credit where it's due, I worked as the team lead on this. Susanna Mayu from the London School of Health and uh, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine was the reproductive health expert. We had country experts from Mozambique, uh, Cristiano Mazzini. And Dr. Alex Nazar, an MD from Ghana, was our expert on SRHR in Ghana. Um, Sarah Van Bell, who has a PhD from the London School, was also um, a key researcher, an expert in realist evaluation, who helped us out on the project and dealt with the global theory of change. Uh, Sarah is a graduate of IPDET, so it's worth putting a little bit of a plug in there. Uh, the main points I think I want to make are that, that Contribution analysis can be a very effective way of looking at a global thematic evaluation that works both at a global level and at a country level. 
But there is no template. There's no set of guidelines. There's no handbook on how to apply contribution analysis. So researchers and consultants who are, are given the task in their terms of reference to apply contribution analysis have a responsibility to engage with it, to, to live with the principles, and to find practical solutions to how to apply what I think is quite a powerful methodology. The Euro Health Group and KIT, that's the uh, Institute for Tropi Tropical Studies, or the Royal Tropical Institute of the Netherlands, came together and, and bid and won this project from the Danish government. So it's their, their analysis. And I think the team working with them was able to develop some pretty good and fairly creative solutions to the problems of applying uh, contribution analysis at this level. And the final point before I get into the details is I think the evaluation community generally needs to work on a, I don't know, I keep going in and out, right? No, it's perfect. Okay. It needs to develop a community of practice and possibly eventually some more concrete guidelines so practitioners can work with that I think is a pretty powerful method. Um, in case you really are new to it, the basic elements of applying contribution analysis in a, in a complex evaluation is you have to remember it's a theory-based methodology. These are theory-based evaluations which means you have to have somehow access to a theory of change for the program. What we find in practice is that most often means the evaluation team will develop a detailed theory of change because uh, evaluation or development agencies very seldom have a fully uh, articulated theory of change. They have what I like to call notions of change. So they have either a partial theory of change or they have one that's such a level of abstraction that you can't actually test it. So you, you, will, you will find as an evaluation team that you yourselves working usually from documentation but also from interviews, will have to develop a reasonably concrete theory of change. It combines elements of impact evaluation, that is a real focus on results, with more process-oriented evaluation or, or what's sometimes referred to as realist evaluation because you're really looking at how different kinds of instruments lead to those results and what the linkages are. It requires, and I think this is one of the most important points, if you're going to apply a contribution analysis, the evaluation team has to develop a way of challenging the theory of change. And a lot of John's work has been around this question of how you challenge the theory of change in evaluation in a credible way. What were the particular challenges of applying CA in the case of the Danish strategy on sexual and human uh, and uh, reproductive health and rights? First, we had to develop a theory of change and test the theory of change at both a global level and in two countries, Ghana and Mozambique, which were chosen for various reasons. There is always the problem of granularity, as I call it. That is, at what level are you going to develop the theory of change? If it's at too high a level, it can't be realistically tested. If it's at too micro a level, there are too many linkages to be tested and the report would be a thousand pages long. And how do you make the connection between the global element of the strategy and the country level of the strategy? And then, of course, there's another practical question, which is where do you apply the challenge function? Does the challenge function apply to each individual link in the theory of change? Does it apply to the whole theory? Or does it apply to pieces of the theory? And then what are the criteria you're going to use to challenge the theory of change in a credible way? and to balance or bolster the contribution story that you come up with at the end of the evaluation. We developed a number of responses as a team. The first one was we focused on a limited number of what we called contribution pathways. Uh, I'll, I'll be able to explain this a little more in the next slide. We also developed a common set of criteria which we applied consistently on every contribution pathway, whether it was at a country level or whether it was at a global level. And we also developed a graphical approach to displaying the results, and I'll, I'll illustrate that in a couple of minutes. And using the Ghana country study as an example. Now, the first question about granularity. Here is the eventual full, complete, complex theory of change for Denmark's support to sexual and reproductive health and rights in Ghana. It has about 40 linkages, and that's a fairly simplified version of it. Along with this, there were 30 pages 
of detailed tables on the risks and assumptions that underlie the theory of change. Now, it's just not practical to develop an evaluation plan that's going to credibly test every one of those linkages. So what was our solution? We identified four what we call program area pathways or contribution pathways in Ghana. Support to the national health system through the Ministry of Health, the Ghana Health Services, and the Christian Health Association of Ghana. So that was one pathway. Another one was through support to international NGOs active in SRHR. Another one was support to the National HIV and AIDS program. And finally, support to UNFPA, which is a major player in SRHR. So if we go back to the more complex one, each of those pathways can be seen as taking one or more chunks of this very complicated table. Now, of course, you still have the problem of what are you going to do in each of those pathways. But at the overall evaluation level, since we had four, evaluation, four program area pathways in Ghana, we had the four same pathways in Mozambique plus two more, and then we had what we called policy area pathways at the global level. So we had simplified the problem down to looking at 10 different systems, if you will, for the evaluation. Now, the criteria we developed uh, are the following ones. We looked at what we called the necessity of the support or the intervention. Was it important within a set of interventions sponsored by the national government, by NGOs, and by other donors, was it an important component there's some question as to whether that were actually necessary. Perhaps progress could be made without these components, but there is the issue of whether they fit into a system that makes an important contribution. We looked at the clarity of the linkages from the Danita support to the eventual outcomes we were able to document. We looked at the significance of, CETA's, of Danita support, and that significance was not just in dollar terms, although that was where we started. We looked at its percentage of all external inflows to the sector, but we also looked at the role of the embassy, whether or not uh, Danita was a valued partner in terms of dialogue, whether it was a critical partner to government, whether it was willing to really push the rights agenda, which is so important to the strategy. And then we looked at something we call the immediacy of expected results. This was perhaps the less useful of the five categories because we often found that results were both short, medium, and long term. It was hard to isolate a set of results and say, they're only going to happen in the long term or they will happen in the short term. So as a way of differentiating between one pathway and another, I think immediacy was not the strongest of our, of our criteria. But the fifth criteria did prove to be very useful and that was whether or not, to what extent that pathway had allowed Danish support to identify the risks and to come up with realistic strategies for addressing risks. So those were our five criteria. Now, just to give you a bit of an illustration of what a program area pathway looked like and, and how we illustrated the results, in it, this is one of four in Ghana and in itself it's reasonably complex. But you have to remember we didn't apply the criteria to each single linkage, we applied them to the system as a whole although we did identify the strengths and weaknesses of different linkages. What you see on here as a dotted line is a weak linkage, and it's, it's probably more fully illustrated in some of the other parts of the report, but we also had a convention where the, the thicker the line, the more clear the, the linkage was and the more direct the contribution was. If it was a contribution that ended, we, had a, we used a different color and there were various methods we used to kind of illustrate this. Uh, Finally, in Ghana, for the country as a whole, we were able to take each of the pathways, health sector support, support to NGOs, support to UNFPA, and look at how they contributed to the five main goals of the strategy, which were gender equality, women's empowerment, young people's access, changing actual results in SRHR in terms of maternal mortality and contraceptive prevalence rates and other measures, and finally, linking HIV and the AIDS response to SRHR. So we were able to document the strength of the contribution of each of the pathways to those uh, four key uh, goals of the, of the strategy. So that's basically how we went about it. 
the lessons we learned from applying it were that the contribution pathways approach provided a solution to the problem of granularity. But it also meant the reports were very lengthy and very complex. Each country report was probably 100 pages when uh, Danita's guidelines call for something like 30 pages. And we just had the argument that, that we needed that space. Again, this, the synthesis report, I think we got it in 65 pages when it was supposed to be 50, and we had to fight over those extra 15 pages. But it is a complicated story to tell when you use this approach. The findings are very context specific, and we found if we looked at all the time and resources we spent as researchers, both globally and in the country, at least half went to documenting and understanding the context. And not a lot of the findings were the kind of global findings you could say would apply everywhere. They were, they were very much tied to the context. The criteria were easy to apply and easy to get agreement on, and as I've already said, some were more useful than others in coming up with findings. The, the graphic approach really helped our, our clients and the program people, whether it was the government of Ghana, the government of Mozambique, or the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, really understand our analysis. They, they, they were able to comprehend what we were trying to do and they were able to understand it. And finally, the findings we had and when we reported them, they were very easy to defend because we could go back deeper into the, into the research anytime we wanted because of the way we had built up the, the uh, program area pathways or the contribution pathways as we called them. So that was really our experience uh, on, the, uh, on the, the application of, of this, what to us was I think a fairly new uh, methodology in terms of applying it to both a global strategy and complex, prob complex programs in a given country. But I will invite John to give his observations since as already noted, he's considered to be the father of contribution analysis. So. I think that uh, John Maine is, is sort of stuck with that title for life, whether he likes it or not. Um, but uh, I, I'm uh, happy to introduce John again. Um, you know that he is one of our facilitators this year, so he's already been briefly introduced to you once. Uh, but John has uh, been with the federal government of Canada for many years. Uh, in the Office of the Auditor General with the Canadian Treasury Board uh, and um, with the Office of the Controller General. Um, he is um, a very thoughtful person uh, and an excellent and, I'd say, prolific writer. He has uh, numerous articles, uh, edited six books, in the area of program evaluation and public administration and performance monitoring. He's been awarded the Canadian Evaluation Society Award for Contribution to Evaluation in Canada, and he's also a Canadian Evaluation Society Fellow. So John, we look forward to your response to Ted's presentation. John. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, yeah, always uh, happy to talk a bit about contribution analysis. And uh, uh, it, it, can, it, it is a, 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 a methodology that I see being increasingly used uh, and tried. Uh, I think Ted's experience might be the first at trying to do it at a kind of a global level. Uh, and I, I think that was... I've, I've been talking to him about it, and I think there's, uh, there are some lessons there to learn. Uh, as he said at the beginning, um, the, I put out sort of the ideas behind contribution analysis now almost 20 years ago. Uh, it's taken a while to kind of catch on, 
but there haven't been um, operational guidelines developed and different, as Ted said, different people trying to apply it have used, have used it differently. And there's now, there's now a growing uh, body of literature on application. Um, and uh, the, that was sort of my intention, that, uh, just to set out some ideas that I seem to make sense to me and uh, hope that people would pick, pick it up. Um, so uh, there, there isn't a template, and uh, certainly interesting to, to, to see and hear what, uh, how Ted and his team tackled the obvious challenges. Um, the, the idea of uh, contribution pathways, as he called them, I think is, is important. Um, they're essentially what I talk about calling nested theories of change. And I'm going to spend a bit of time next week. I'm work, uh, giving a presentation with Linda on Tuesday, Wednesday next week, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that. But it, it's it's sort of a way of trying to take big, complicated, what I sometimes call messy interventions, and make something out of them. If you try to put a theory of change on paper that try to covers everything, you just get a mess and no one understands it except the one person that maybe put it, put it all together. So finding a way to break it up uh, into uh, what Ted calls contribution pathways, I think are very, I, I can't see any other way that to, to address these kind of complicated, messy interventions. Um, the, uh, another important feature that, uh, that Ted mentioned and other authors have, have, have talked about, you know, is the need to challenge the theory of change that, that you develop and, and, and the contribution pathways, the nested theories of change. Uh, I think it's very important to sort of have that, to play that challenge role, either as a, uh, in a participatory, ideally in a participatory manner with, with clients, stakeholders, and maybe beneficiaries, um, that isn't always possible in a, in a, in a consulting assignment, but then uh, I think it's important then to have maybe someone from outside the team to sort of come in and challenge, raise questions about, about the theory of change, its assumptions, and whatever evidence is being, is being applied. Uh, I think additionally, the, the issue of then challenging the, the, the contribution story that results from the analysis is another important aspect to, to sort of coming up with, with, credible, with credible findings. Um, the, the particularly interesting idea that, uh, that Ted's group used was the idea of uh, assessing the, the strength of the contribution pathways. So looking at these, I think he said there were 10 uh, pathways identified, which are, again, nest, in my language, nested theories of change, and then trying to trying to test them or challenge them and look at how strong, how strong they were. And those are the cri five criteria that Ted set out and applied at the, that sort of nested theory of change level, not at, which is what I've written more about, at the individual link level, all the different links, the different, all the different arrows in, in, a, in a contribution, in a, in a theory of change. And that, again, is, is a sort of the practicality of, of what, uh, what they were faced with. Um, and I think that's an issue I like to, I'm hoping to sort of pursue a bit more and try to get Ted to join together to sort of explore um, that idea and, and the criteria that, that used. Um, the um, breaking down a, a complex theory of change I have found can be done two ways, um, either by gathering together the different strategies used by the intervention uh, that may be across, across locations or across partners, or uh, more common uh, by um, target groups reached. So looking at the different target groups that were reached and, looking, and then developing a theory of change, or what I have called also a theory of reach for those different target groups. Uh, and that's, I think, close to what, what Ted did. I think they were sort of reach pathways looking at uh, uh, international NGOs, the health sector, the things like that. And that's uh, a, sort of a sensible, obvious, obvious way to break down, uh, break down things, because the intervention then is doing something specifically with 
these different target groups, and you can kind of start tracking, tracing the, the theory of change that way. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's useful. Um, theories of change, the, the, the key is, is, is the assumptions and risks that are, that are there, that are behind, that are setting out the preconditions that are needed for, for things to work. Um, and again, uh, Ted uh, talked a bit about that. Um, and those assumptions and risks can be based on a number of things. Uh, again, uh, three kinds of evidence in particular, either on prior research and evaluation, on stakeholder beliefs, ideas about how the intervention is supposed to work, or in an ex post case on what you're actually observing in, in the case at hand. Uh, sort of the grounded, uh, grounded assumptions. Um, another point that Ted raised and that other authors have raised uh, is how to sort of how to tell a contribution story because it, it's it, even in simpler cases it's not quite so obvious because it, it requires a lot more words and explanation than where you're able to do the uh, you know the randomized controlled trial type of design, which you can explain pretty easily and, and present the evidence pretty easily. These are more complicated versions of different ways of, alternative ways of thinking about causality and require more words. And then when you have a very complex case as Ted had, the whole thing becomes fairly, fairly complex. Um, it does seem to me that if you're, in, in Ted's case, if you're trying to evaluate that global strategy in those two countries of uh, intervention by, by Danita, um, that to think you're going to come up with a simple 50-page summary that sort of says what happened across that way, I think is, is dreaming. Uh, that if you have a very complicated intervention, you're going to have a complicated story to tell about it. Uh, and uh, So I'm I, I think you would have to fight back and get get more pages to add. Um, the um, I also want to ask Ted about. Um, I just noticed in his presentation he had uh, uh, someone involved in realist evaluation involved in, on the team. Um, not an not an area I've worked too much on, but I have done some recent work on um, realist evaluation has also been around about 20 years, 97 the first book came out. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of done a much better job of, uh, of PR and, and pushing itself and, and lots of examples and textbooks and out there. Um, more recently I, I've been doing, doing some work with, with a client uh, and realizing that I think there's a very close link between realist evaluation and contribution analysis and you can sort of explain one in terms of the other. Um, that's a, a, future, a future paper that has yet to be written, but uh, I, think that, I think that is the case. They're all sort of these theory-based approaches, and so they, when you think about it, they're gonna have some similarity among them to sort of arrive at conclusions. Um, so that's it, I think this is a very interesting example. There, as I mentioned, there's quite a few examples now out there on, on the use of, of contribution analysis, um, and I, expect to see more. As Ted said, there's more and more calls for a contribution analysis. And um, given that I just, the, my initial uh, papers on that were just sort of giving kind of outlines of ideas and frameworks, there's a lot of room for innovation and application as, as, as Ted has done. So I think we'll both look forward to your questions. Thank you. Join us. Uh, please do not touch the podium microphone. <laughs> do not touch. These are supposed to work if you stand in the center. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Can you see me? Even better now. I love that. Can't do anything about that one. <laughs> okay. Um, cutting edge. Not going to find it anywhere else. What you heard today is cutting edge. Did you hear did Kim talk about realist evaluation, one of the approaches, at least briefly? You heard it today, right? It's being talked about, being used, 
um, an approach people are, are talking about, thinking about, working about, and now you can hopefully at least relate, have a, a context for it. So the floor is open for questions. Again, tell us who you are, where you're from, and whether your question is directed towards John or Ted or both of them. What questions do we have? I see a hand up in the back. Do we have a microphone? Wait for the microphone. And remember to tell us your name and where you're from and who your question's directed to. Okay, uh, this is Asad from Sudan. Uh, one of the challenges that we are facing now is that we need retrospectively construct theory of change or contribution pathway. And I would like to know how you mitigate the risk of biases because you know most of the programs that you know started five years ago they don't have uh, theory of change or contribution pathway. So you retrospectively construct this theory of change and pathway. The other thing that I'm thinking, one of the challenges that we are development practitioner, we never look for the profit sector. And one of the practices is the MSP. Uh, MSP, it is an abbreviation stand for management of successful programs. It is for the profit business. It is a British standard in project, program, and portfolio management, equivalent to American Institute of Project and Program and portfolio management. They refer to something similar to that. I would like to know if you have looked uh, uh, to, to, to these practices in the profit sector regarding benefit reali realization analysis in which it is similar to some way. You, you map uh, your, uh, your capabilities, the transformational change, then you see the, their contribution to formulation of the benefit and realization of the benefit. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for a very enlightening presentation, Ted. I'm wondering, I'm a planner. Sorry, my name is Augusta, I come from Iceland. I'm a planner. I've done more planning than evaluations. And you're always reconstructing theory of change. Does that mean that the planners were not doing a good job? Or do we need to educate them in, in evaluation techniques? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Delphine Colbo. I work for the UN system in Haiti. Uh, I'm mostly a planner. So um, my question is, because for us, is, we're really trying to show, as the UN, a contribution, but we're struggling. And my question is, do you have concrete examples of what you use to determine, for instance, if a pathway line was thick or it was thin, or it was little, you know, it was not there, or it was interrupted, because these concrete ways to determine how strong the contribution is, is really what is hard for us. Thank you. Okay. If, if I understand the, the first gentleman's question had to do with, and, and I'm, I'm not sure I got it all, but whether we used we consulted examples from the private sector on how to, 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 and other sectors of pulling together these kinds of theories of change and contribution. We, we, we did a little bit in the sense that we, we uh, worked with some of the international NGOs that are involved in the area. Um, and we did have some contact with the private sector that, that has a role to play in SRHR. But I have to say that what we found, and this, this links, I think, to the question of whether the planners have done their job or not, um, we found that either the, the theories of change that were labeled theories of change in the documentation, in the decision-making process by the programs themselves, tended to be so high level. You know, you could summarize them, you know, with a little tree and a couple of arrows, and 
there was really no, no practical way to test assumptions at that high a level. So we had to get involved. Now, does that mean the planners didn't do their job? What we did see was that over time, the, the, the designs got better and better. So a program that had two five-year cycles by the end of 10 years was much more concrete. So I think that the planners that we looked at were probably, if you want to say didn't do their job, they were working at too high a level of abstraction to test at the beginning, but through a series of midterm reviews and, and, and sending out sector experts and, and encountering difficulties and reacting to them, there was a really quite a strong evolution over time. The question of how to practically challenge and test the, uh, the assumptions or the, the linkages in the theory of change. I can give you one example. Um, in the evolution in Mozambique from one program to the next, and Denmark deals in five-year programs with multi-million dollar budgets. So when they went from a program that ended in 2011 to the new five-year program in 2012, they pushed very hard on the idea of um, in, in, uh, making an intervention in nutrition could have a role to play in sexual and reproductive health. Um, has to do with, with the, the health of expectant mothers and, and incidence of, of unsafe abortion and incidence of maternal disease and maternal death. We tested that link as best we could and we found it was very weak. It was weak in terms of the theory, but it was also weak because in order to operationalize it, they would have had to make the link between family planning and nutrition. There would have had to be an effort in the design of the program that when they were introducing the nutritional component, they would actively integrate it into family planning for birth spacing reasons and other things. Now, for that, we relied on, on the best experts we could find in sexual and reproductive health. So you have to have both the evaluation side or evaluators engaged, and you have to have the sector experts engaged. But it was really that kind of testing the logic back and forth. Uh, and the criteria worked in the sense that we were able to get agreement from both first the evaluation team, but eventually the program people as well. We had very little pushback on the negative findings we had because we were able to demonstrate that we applied those five criteria consistently. Each case is going to be quite different, though. Um, just a few, a few comments. Um, the, um, I, yeah, I have no knowledge of uh, sort of heavy private sector involvement in, in a lot of this stuff. But I do mention that there, in the last three or four years there's been three uh, reviews of the use of theories of change and development evaluation published that sort of give a wide range of, of the issue, all concluding, as Ted said, that sort of the term theory of change is all over the map as to what it really is and who's applying it and stuff. Um, so perhaps not, not that helpful. Uh, the planning question is of great interest to me because I've been, in effect, the last quite a while now working in that mode uh, and using theories of change in a planning context. Uh, and uh, I, I, some very, I think some very interesting work uh, done by the, the Agriculture for Health, for Nutrition and Health uh, Research Program in CGIR has really gotten onto the theory of change bandwagon and has been using theories of change and exploring some of the kind of interventions they're, they're trying to bring about and bring to scale. Uh, and uh, as uh, to using theories of change to identify where there are weaknesses in, the, in, in, the, in what they're trying to do, where more research may be needed, uh, where they need to bring in other partners to make, to make things happen. Uh, I, I think the use of theories of change in planning context is, is, a, is a huge potential uh, and uh, should be, you know, sh should be, I think when people understand what it can do, I think it can be very helpful. Uh, unfortunately, as Ted said, most of the time evaluators come in, there isn't much around. Um, hopefully that's changed, hopefully that's changing. Um, the identification of of sort of contribution pathways or the bits and pieces, how to, how to break things up, which I thought was part of the last question. Um, again, I, I would s s 
I stress the idea that uh, the idea of reach and thinking about your intervention and who you're trying to reach, what are the target groups to, that you're trying to reach is, is a powerful idea that you can use to sort of help you dissect otherwise complicated mess. Uh, and uh, I found it extremely useful and continue to do so. Uh, Just to add on, on a sort of a practical note of how, how we went about doing the ver validation of our pathways, that, that they made sense. At the end, we had, we had a separate inception mission to each of the countries, and at the end of that first inception mission, not the evaluation mission itself, but the planning mission, we gathered together all of the stakeholders that we could get in one big room, and we presented them the, the contribution pathways we wanted to test. And we said, do you recognize these as the important pathways? Are we missing something? Is there something else we should include? Or are these somehow not legitimate? And, and I think the key test for me was that they recognized that. They went from that very complicated diagram I showed you, which they agreed was reasonably concrete, to those four pathways in Ghana. And they said, yes, if you can cover those four pathways, you'll have captured 90% of what we're trying to do here. So that was. I think we can take uh, maybe two more questions and then wrap it up. I see two hands. I actually just, uh, I got a half answer to what I wanted to ask. So this is about the criteria for uh, selection the pathway. By the way, my name is Oker uh, Nazarov. I am from UNICEF Uzbekistan. Apologies. Um, so uh, just one question. I think I got the answer. Uh, these are, these are certainly the validation of the pathways. So you do before. Uh, and there's certain criteria you come up with to dissect uh, different pathways. The problem, I see the one issue here. Let's say the Uganda and Mozambique, uh, the, the two countries might have a different pathways which could be important. You are looking for the common pathways so to be able to come up with a contribution, if I'm correct, to be, to be able to link them. So it should be something in common for Mozambique and uh, let's say Ghana, uh, I think it was Ghana, right? In your example. Now, the problem is often it's not the case. I mean, Mozambique might have a, uh, some pathways which are, would be extremely important. Ghana would have another pathway, uh, but uh, you focusing on something common could actually will uh, take out these extremes, which, which, which could be potentially very important, and that could actually uh, drive your analysis to some, some, I mean, I would say slightly to the different results. So I, I'm kind of curious how you actually come, up, how you actually tackle this issue because uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are no common pathways for both countries. Well, they, 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 are, they are pathways, but I, I don't know if they are equally important. Something important for one might not be important for another one. I don't know. Please. Thank you. Second question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Gregor from South Africa. Uh, first for uh, Ted, it seems to be an extensive exercise, so I'd be very curious if you could tell us the budget uh, um, that was used, uh, because we were told that relations is often expensive and not always possible because of that. And for John, as the father of uh, contribution theory, do you have under any other children that you could tell us about? Thank you. <laughs> do you have any other children, any other theoretical children? or otherwise? <laughs> Yeah, if I can first respond to the question of, of different pathways in different countries. Our, our, I think our guiding principle was context. Always be relevant in the context. What we found when I talked about the four pathways in Ghana, support delivered through UNFPA, through international NGOs, through the Ministry of Health, the, the central health system, if you will, and then the HIV AIDS program. Those four did occur in Mozambique, but not with the same level of importance. We clearly identified that. Um, and for instance, international NGOs are not nearly as active in Mozambique as they are in Ghana. There is a much more active uh, local uh, civil society network on sexual and reproductive health in Mozambique than there is in Ghana, so there were big differences. But we also had two very important pathways in Mozambique that we didn't have in Ghana. One was direct Danita support to decentralized health care in one province, and that got a great deal of attention. And the other one was the use of common funds to fund local consortia of NGOs, which doesn't happen in Ghana. So we were open definitely to the idea that there would be different uh, pathways in different countries. And we tried to recognize that context. So we started with the notion that 
the purpose of case studies is not necessarily to generalize. You will only generalize if you see a common theme running across the country case studies. And you have to give, and that's one reason why the reports became very complicated, because you had to reflect the difference between Ghana and Mozambique, which are quite huge. In, in, I mean, there's all sorts of contextual differences, but there are also programmatic differences. On the budget, I guess that must be, there was a public tender, they put it out in public, so it must not be confidential. I wasn't the person who put together the team budget, so I'm not, I think, uh, I'm gonna say 250,000 euros, something like that was the budget, so. It was not inconsequential. Uh, yeah, the, I think the, just a short comment on the, if you're faced with dealing with, um, for example, a number of different countries and you're trying to sort of draw some conclusions overall, um, then I think uh, you, and, and if you find that there are some similar strategies used in, in a variety of countries, then that might be a way to break things up uh, by strategy, by the kind of, strat kind of intervention strategy that's been used, or sub-strategy, uh, and develop then theories of breach, con con contribution pathways based on that, uh, rather than on who you're trying to reach in each country, which of course will be different. Um, uh, other children, <laughs> I am uh, pushing a, a, a different, slightly different version of theories of change uh, than I, perhaps what you've, had, you've seen here, which I'm going to talk about next week, uh, that's based on the idea of reach. Uh, basically saying a theory of change is who do you reach, what are you trying to change in terms of their capacity, how does their behavior change, what's the benefit and what's improvement in well-being. So it's that rather than the more traditional and used everywhere, output, immediate outcome, intermediate, all that sort of stuff. So, but I'm publishing something on that next fall, and uh, I, I found it a much more useful uh, tool for building a theories of change uh, myself. Anyway. Join me in thanking them for this cutting edge. Thank you. Thank you. Don't tell me that, Thank you. Don't tell Don't tell Don't Thank you. We have a little something for each of you. Now, John is retired and, and could take an expensive gift, but we don't have an expensive gift for you. But we do have an inexpensive but beautiful paperweight for you. Thank you. And a beautiful, inexpensive but beautiful paperweight Thank for you. you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.